Oh, right. I'm not alone when I say that I don't think we'll ever get anything quite like Rule 19 again, which is why it's so important that we document it. Uh, I, well, it introduced uh, urban combat especially, which was just on the scale of nothing we had ever seen before. And, and now we had this giant hulk of a tank. Like, it, I think it was this point that the Wardens were the most divided since before Callahan came along. I served as a field artillery crewman from early on. After Jade, I didn't bog myself down into the clan drama or the public outroar that occurred even. I just fought on. Maybe if there were more of us who just buckled down and did their job, we, we might have avoided all the suffering. War 19 was quite the war, I suppose. Well, when War 20 came along, I volunteered for that, and the one after that, and the one after that. I think I can safely say that after all my uh, years of service, uh, there won't ever be quite anything like War 19 again. Here we stand two years after the end of hostilities. Both nations have shifted their resources from destruction to construction. A burgeoning sector, as we've seen from the revamping of towns all across Siva. A leap in science today, but with renewed tensions between nations as the power of the rocket is revealed. Either backs out as a call to arms rings at an unprecedented rate. Flash. The Valayan Republic has cut off diplomatic ties with SEVA. As we speak, both nations begin their respective militarization efforts. This is Jeffrey Jennings of the Press Corps, updating you on the latest iteration of the Foxhole War, unfolding before our very eyes. We had the DR go straight towards where the plan was, south of River Mercy, and the infantry was at Huskall. Then we moved to assist them while we were waiting. Uh, the DR took out a bunch of shit on the way to Jade Cove as well as Husk Hollow. FFL went over to Winged Walk. They took the other side really easy and they grabbed a CV. Uh, they got there far up before we did uh, for the other side of the bridge. Uh, we then started getting pushed back as well as at the same time there was... I forgot what Colonial Clan it was, but they went up to Sickle Hill and was annoying us in Apollo's landing in Sickle Hill for the longest fucking time. 22 ACR. Uh, what was it? 12 DK soldiers versus 7, 17 ACR in that uh, Sickle Hill battle. After we kicked out the Colonials from Sickle Hill, we went and pushed them out. Uh, without them distracting us, we kind of pushed out the enemy because they were kind of running out of shirts. Granted, we were too, but... We pushed them out, and FFL got Makas. They held Makas for the longest fucking time, too. And then we eventually just kind of pushed into Victa a bit and got stuck over there. Mainly got stuck in Cora Lush Land, so. Um, and then we pushed into Westgate. Uh, went over, uh, got Killian, then to the Gallows, and then went down from Lord's Mouth to Alkimo Estate. Uh, I was with Warden Navy, and we were over in Kingstone holding out there because Ubal, uh fighting up the hill from Kingstone to Westgate is a horror terror, and I hate it. Yep. And I have to keep going back there, and it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're actually really nice. With their, they were doing mortar, and they were doing uh, HMG squads. Or they had a few people doing HMGs at least. All right. Unexpectedly, we had the most successful armor car operation I've ever seen in my 1,300 hours. Wow. We didn't lose Where a was single that? armor car. Was that Westgate? Yeah, Westgate. We didn't lose no. a single armor car hmm. in the whole six hours. Okay. Basically, a strong push um, starting with a, a small fob north of Killeen's Quarter, no resistance there, taking the town, just cleaning it up. A howitzer on the town hall itself, that took about five minutes to set up. 
And then shortly after we took the town hall, about six enemy armored cars showed up. But as again, it was most, our most successful operation with armored cars. So two versus six, R2-1. And then it was just really an uneventful push from there to Lord's Mouth, from Lord's Mouth to the Bulwark Wall, then to Alchemio, and then from Alchemio to Farm Wait, Cross. Then who got Gallows? Because I thought you guys did. Uh, Gallows was taken by Randoms, though the Town Hall was taken down by Death Riders and other parties. Okay. Hmm. The same thing for King's... Uh, Kingstone. There was so many fucking Kali's, and it was fighting uphill, and it was up fighting uphill with a lot of Kali's is horror terror. Especially when oh. they got, uh, gun nests. I was gone by the time we got long zone, but, uh, we built defenses all the way from Lord's Mouth, or basically from Killian to Akimio State along the road. Made sure our trucks were safe to get in there. Our, the main clan was K Cop, though... Their largest assault was with the six ACs. After that, I didn't see much opposition. Where was the front uh, exactly? The, uh, the first day that much as Keening and Victor were both folk on the colonial side and they were pushing us at Jade Cove. So, like me, I came when the Jade Cove was on the attack. I joined them. And we had our ACs there, the FMG, and uh, then we pushed out. That was on the first day. Oh, we had block out the fields and yeah. wing walk. We are uh, the, the bridge. bridge was, yeah, the bridge was a constant skirmish. They kept pushing across with uh, grenades, uh, with rifle grenades, and then eventually we would push across, take one of their fobs, but then get pushed back. Yeah, we had our front at the wing walk that was pushed by a co group of colleagues. McCarthy Fields from the east. McCarthy is also from Kura Lushlands from the south and at the Pleading Wall. So we had basically everywhere fights and we had no information about the m numbers or where is the main force. We had no FOBs near the McCarthy field. We had a lot of people holding Jade Cove. They tried always to push into Jade Cove. On the second day, this is the second defense of uh, Jade Cove, okay. we had a fob here at the mouth of the funnel, where, uh, as well as some howitzer emplacements along the side of the ramp of Jade Cove. They never really got up to Jade Cove. From the second defense, we uh, they tried it. They built up a second OFB near the ramp. They charged us with pure infantry and barraged us with howitzers. They made it up to the ramp and they kept the fighting there for a while until we were able to bring in our own armored cars again and push back out. And at that point, uh, we were able to make it out of there. Was, uh, they pushed not. Over the River Mercy, they got the Wink Walk FOB and pushed across the Reaping Fields. So they took us Kolo after that terror, but we managed to push them back. What was surprisingly for us, for some people, we had constantly good logistic, then we could get a group together and push them back. Oh, so they were yes. never able to push west and cut off the J Cove? No, no. It was, uh, the last FOB was a sickle hill. And at the third day, we pushed them all back. Into much as Keening and Victor at least. At the start of the war, we were fighting in Frantic Coast. Unfortunately, the Warden somehow managed to capture Jade Cove before we could. Uh, we are only left with Victor and Marcus Keening. We've led landing operations in Frantic Coast and pushing front lines with howitzer batteries, but it wasn't enough and we were kicked out of Frantic Coast eventually. I think it was really more of the terrain that we were trying to fight into. Jade Cove is a 
hard place to advance into. From the south side, you're constrained to a small piece of land that connect, connects the south southern Ferranic to Jade Cove. It's like a valley. So pushing down that isn't exactly the easiest thing because the wardens only have to attack you from one. And there was one day that we actually did manage to push through that funnel and we were actually inside the town. But on the north side of Jade Cove, it's uh, immediately an uphill battle. There's a steep grade that you have to push up. And yeah, I believe the area is called Sickle Hill. Because it was a hill, we weren't able to push up it. And by the time we were pushing up it, it was getting really late into the day where people had to start logging off. And because of that, we didn't have an opportunity to fortify our our gains. And the next day, uh, we lost uh, Jade Cove. But I, I was there. They had came to Liberation Street. And I could immediately tell that if we didn't do something about take him out of Liberation Street, that we were going to have a problem uh, in the long run. And we weren't able to muster up enough people to take care of it, and we lost Frantic Ghost. One day, we had organized a staging area in Arbreaker under my command, specifically. And we got, a, we got the entirety of 22 ACR to do logistics and preparation for this in naval invasion to Frantic Coast. Uh, once we were finished doing our prepping, uh, other clans joined in in assistance, SOM and Reborn, and we were able to capture a fort in Frantic Coast and recaptured Victa. Unfortunately, we were overwhelmed and the, the wardens kicked us out of Frantic Coast. We had recently had just unlocked field artillery. And we pushed them up, and we took down Foundry really easily because the Wardens couldn't counter it. We had infantry and half-track support. They tried attacking our FAs, but they failed. Um, I don't know. I don't think it's really given us a, an edge, because even though we've had tanks longer than the Wardens, we've still seemed to be in the same position we, we were before we had tanks. Matter of fact, unless sure, we, we've had a, a good foothold when we've had field artillery and, and tanks and they were able to kick us out so it hasn't really given us a, a one-up on the wardens because we're losing ground well things have uh, been going very well uh for the wardens with the exception of tech um on day one we helped dk secure faradak um, we went over to Winged Block and then took Machas while DK attacked uh, Jade's Cove on day one. Um, then I think it was days two and three that we uh, just stayed in Machas, uh, basically. Just like fighting around uh, Jade's Cove, Machas, that area. Uh on day four, we went and um, uh, took the snag forts and pushed the road south of Machas, and uh, that enabled the uh, Jade Cove to uh, push back out and resecure the southern part of Faranac, which was uh, hard for us to do at first. Really, that uh, that flank to the snag forts, and then we, whenever we pushed west from there, that was that was probably the most effective thing that we did did the whole war. pushed up with ACs, um, we managed to get three trucks full of supplies, um, e.g. B mats, heavy machine guns, HE grenades, and we slowly worked our way up the main road towards Hoss Hollow on both sides, so that way we thin out the enemy defenders and make them um, paranoid. So once we hit Hoss Hollow and took the um, town hall, we had reinforcements come in by two. So first one truck came in with six guys. Ten minutes later, another six guys came through. Once we took the River Mercy and pushed across the other side of the bridge, we met up with the rest of the WN clan members and 82DK. And then once we hit Cora's last land, that was when we 
met up with FFL. Marches Keening actually fell down at the same time as Hoskolo, which was very impressive. Um, what we did in cooperation with the other clans was very successful. Eight ACs pushing to Victor, four going to one flank, the left flank, and then four going to the right flank while the main infantry pushed down the road. We, we completely surrounded the town at Victor, and then after that, attrition came into the colonials and they just fell. Oh yes, definitely. Um, I wasn't there for a little bit of it because I was having troubles getting to there and setting my spawn. But um, we had at, we had a defensive spearhead led by von klaus and um i believe grumpy burrito uh and they were holding out the best they could uh j cove between supplying it navally and by land and um supplying soldiers via the sea to the back lines um we ended up holding out as much as we can i was i don't have very many details though we were just doing a routine check on the archipelagos just to make sure that the newbies there were from the sale were doing all right at least in, as long as they could hold their own the infantry on the main island ore breaker they were being pushed back into the town hall at the ides and they were about to lose the town when we came to the ides with i want to say 10 of our squad members narwhals and regular navy men uh we saw the havoc of just bombardment and uh, gas attacks and APC rushes. We knew that we had to help in some way. So what we did was we had our narwhals spearhead the front for the newbies while we had our navy men try and attack their back lines with barges. Um, we, it was a brutal fight. We ended up bombing out a fob that was just outside of the Ides Howitzer Reach. And we instructed the randoms to wait out 10 minutes for their defenses to go down. After that, we pretty much pushed them back into their port base for a good day or so. I think as soon as we unlock all the tech as well, it shouldn't be that hard of a fight because we have the neutral clans with us this war round. And even if we didn't, uh, we won last war even when all the neutral clans were on the Kali side. It's just a matter of getting the tech, working together, and trying to coordinate between the clans and randos to push into the back lines of the collies and hopefully test out one of the ballistic missiles. Um, basically, we have a few land divisions, but the one I would like to focus primarily on is our most active, the Marines slash the elite version of them, the Narwhals. Uh, Narwhal standing for an acronym that's way too long to pronounce, so I'll just leave that out. Our Narwhals are led by our Commodore, Sakari, uh, who is an excellent Marine person. He has led numerous successful operations as, as the Narwhals have been formed. The Narwhals themselves are a band of our best ground troops that Sakari has handpicked from the Navy to operate on land whenever gunboats are not available or just not a viable option at the time. What we usually have them do is uh, we, the admirals and the rear admirals give them the orders and we let Sakari do the rest because he is third in command basically and um, he knows his stuff on land and sea, whether it be raiding or naval invasion or just regular gunboat stuff. So Whenever we just give him a task, he usually has the right answer to how to perform said task, down to the detail. We ha operated out of Handsome Hideaway. We set up a fob and the watchtower there, uh, had a few barges transporting troops and items, such as BMATs and those such, just basic logy stuff. And we were raiding logistics lines and their back lines in, um, with our barges. We worked with a clan, an Aussie clan named Anzac, a few times during our time in Westgate. And uh, we helped try and take out Taswell Point before we had our artillery from the sea with gunboats. Uh, once we had gunboats, though, we 
tended to just bomb out Tassel Point and its observation tower. And we're actually in the middle of still doing that right now. The, the push started at Killian. Uh, that was the initial breakthrough. 82 and a few other, um, wouldn't call them partisans, but a few other stragglers broke through the lines. Uh, took out Killian's, established a, uh, a foothold there, and then we gathered up and moved from one town to the next. The initial goal was just to break their initial defenses uh, in Westgate and then exploit that breakthrough to take as much territory as possible. We didn't suffer as many casualties as we thought we were going to. Uh, Neither us or 82. Um, we didn't actually encounter much resistance at first. Uh, after we took Killian, the enemy went into a full retreat, uh, seemingly. Mm -hmm. uh, the Kingstone was the, the tough nut to crack for that first push. Um, uh, I know the Warden Navy was involved. They had a very large objective of their own uh, that was Kingston, I believe. Um, yes, they, they originally had that objective. We uh, helped the 82 with theirs, and then we pulled in to um, assist with theirs. Uh, the uh, Warden Navies, I mean. At the peak of the operation, we had 13 people on. We had a few infantry, three mortar teams, spotters, and, um, of course, Tetch in command. At one point, we secured an armored car when we lost a mortar and a drug. Uh, the major push of the operation was completed uh, within the first two and a half hours, and then there was a bit of a downtime, and then a secondary push for the last objective. At the end of the operation, we had Lord's Mouth. We had taken Killian's Lord's Mouth. Uh, Kingstone, like I said, and then... What was the last one? Oh, yeah. We took the Gallows, held that, and then they were, the final push was on Longstone. Uh, when we finished up, the operation was considered a... Resounding success. You think the Clones will be able to get a, some sort of a, a comeback going on? Uh, well, from what I know of the Colonials is that they're very stubborn. Uh, and I think that them taking back their territory has proven that. Mm. However... Even though we have been completely pushed out of the heartlands, and we have been, for the most part, pushed out of Umbral. I don't see them holding that for very long. Um, so I actually wasn't there um, when the prisoners were initially captured. That was Deer Man. Um, I was kind of just manning a foxhole outside of Victor at the time, uh, and then he kind of let us know that he'd found some prisoners. So we kind of just sped along the roads as quick as we could. Um, <laughs> yeah, and the, the gun nests were kind of throwing grenades at us. Yep. Uh, at one point, um, at one point, we were passing a garrison house, and it it uh, disabled the truck. So who the prisoners had to bail out of the truck. Um, and like just run off and we, we had to find another truck and pick them up uh, at first like initially when we set up our labor camp um, once these things started showing up on the radar uh, obviously the back line logic guys was you know started you know screaming in a region chat that there were partisans but once we explained the situation um, you know a couple of the, the logic guys came around to check out what was happening Oh, 
Oleander. Is this the famous or infamous Oleander Monster House? Oleander yeah. Monster House. Yeah, I remember Were that. You there? I I think yeah, Mari was there. Uh, now, unfortunately, the footage has been lost to time. However, I do oh, remember that good. broadcast going about six hours. Six oh, hours yeah, in we, real time. We were we were holding that house for so unbelievably long. It would I, I would be more than happy to tell you the story. It was a nightmare. Yeah, so you were the ones inside the house. Yes. We were some of the ones. Yes. And we, uh, when there, there were treaties called, or like treaties, uh, ceasefires. There, there were ceasefires. There, 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 were, there, there were, were ceasefires. And then I missed out on the ceasefire because I was running logistics down to them by foot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was, he was sneaking supplies into the, into the house so that we could keep fighting. And we were yelling at it, uh, all the colonials, saying, Yeah, no, we just got supplied. Of course, they didn't believe us, but... Oh, they definitely did not. There I am we running did. crazy. Just, just to illustrate how, like, why, why this name of this house got to be named the Monster House. So, like, anything and everything was thrown at this house. Now, this was the first ever appearance of a safe house in the Foxhole this, War. Yeah, uh, I, so, I agree. So, a fully upgraded safe house. So, no one actually knew how to approach it let alone its full function. So people didn't know at the time, that, or at least it wasn't common knowledge enough, that uh, safe houses have artillery shields. All right? Artillery, artillery I think they're really uh, artillery bunker. Artillery bunker. Right? Bunker, yeah. right, right, right. So essentially it's, it's a covering on the roof and then the, uh, a certain structure upgrade. Yeah, the, where yeah, you the can... frames are reinforced, I believe. Exactly. And then it can damage the safe house, but only to a certain extent, after which it will no longer damage the safe house and it's immune. I and believe. it has to be damaged from the inside, then yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, all damage must come from inside, or must happen inside. Yeah. It so, goes down to, a, I think, like 30-odd percent, and uh -huh. then everything has to be done on the inside from there. Gotcha. So, literally, hund literally hundreds of, art of artillery... Howitzers and mortar shells were rained down upon that house, and no one was oh, sure. And it was of men. nonstop. Yeah. We could not hear the the sound of the HMGs firing from every which window, and all of the people screaming on the bottom floor. I I was on the top floor, mind you. I didn't see what was going on, but I could hear it. All of the colonials rushing in, and everyone in the bottom of the house screaming, trying to keep them out. My goodness. I remember having to radio in to ask, is the bottom floor clear? <laughs> I, it, it would take a while. There there would be... It was it was literally human waves, and I am not even exaggerating. No, you're not. Waves upon waves of colonial soldiers ran towards that front door, and we would gun them down as best as we could with the HMGs, but inevitably, five, six got through, and ran inside with bayonets yeah you, you usually uh you know at, at this point i would say well of course you know maybe you're exaggerating a little this is not exaggeration uh, no one knew how to approach safe houses yet so at some point the the colonials were so frustrated and trying because they they took pretty much the rest of the town including the town hall right it was literally just this house left they, they uh, took the town hall was white they, right, it was, it was, they, yeah, they, they it. neutralized the town hall, but they couldn't take it because all there. of the defenses around the, the town hall were still being supplied a uh, garrison by the safe house. Yeah. So clearly you have been on the other end of artillery barrages. What's that like? I mean, I would say we have, we have uh, done a few training exercises, and I think me and Storm, right, we have been on the receiving end of our own barrages. Yeah, um, I was in a truck driving by, and you ordered a strike on me. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, nothing, nothing danger close, I assure you. But we, it, under consistent intermittent howitzer fire, is nowhere near as terrifying. And mind you, we were in a safe house. We weren't at risk. But it is nowhere near as terrifying as hearing six or seven shells falling on top of you at once, and you have no idea which direction to run, because they're all going to land in the general vicinity around you. Right. My goodness, that's terrifying. Oh, boy. He began fighting on the uh, Thunder Road up uh, just north of Thunderfoot. 
with a half track. Uh, my 101st team was a uh, manning a half track with a few guys. I got a second half track running. We, as a team, the Colonials started pushing up through Adzi Crossroads. Um, Ruby Rod was uh, one of my lieutenants, uh, and he was able to help move the front forward using multiple howitzers. And there was a giant implement of infantry with only about two or three armored um, columns of two um, at any one time. I don't think it, any, it grew any larger than two throughout the entire uh, bout. The sieging of Foundry uh, was coordinated by the 101st Guard and uh, Swords of Marrow. Uh, those two uh, high-ranking members that were on the um, field artillery were Lurkus and Death. Uh, myself, Major Fader, um, Lieutenant Ruby Rod, and uh, Patton 360 uh, on my team were manning half-track and security duty so that uh, we could be the shield uh, for the other spear. It was a lot of new recruits. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do this uh, without them being there. They supplied a lot of uh, suppressive fire. Um, they were uh, helping us build and giving us supplies. Once we got south of the foundry, um, we started shelling it. It was pretty um, naked. At, at, there wasn't a whole lot of security teams, but what we needed to do was take their attention off of uh, 22 ACRs, I believe, push from the fort north of the foundry. Um, they had intercepted multiple uh, deliveries to the wardens in foundry, which then fueled that fort's um, supplies and um, ammo, ammunition, uh, medical kits uh, for a number of hours. So that was a, a huge uh, boost for us and a large loss for the wardens. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do it without them. Now, I'm not 100% sure if 22 ACR was uh, doing that. I believe they were. You want to check with them. Um, but that was a huge help for our fight from Thunderfoot to Adzi and then just to the south of the foundry. Once we got there with our FA, we started lighting it up. Um, we had Major Fader in his half track um, providing security around the perimeter. There were um, some few new recruits who were doing excellent that night watching the six of our FA, which almost was compromised by one warden shotgunner. Um, I myself was running combat medic, reviving men, making sure that their wounds were healed and also supplying um, infantry with intel of incoming enemy forces using binoculars in the day. Uh, when it became nighttime, um, we actually got some more reinforcements and we started building a couple sandbags to help our infantry not take shots. Um, but at this point, we had knocked down their town hall at least once, if not twice. Um, the wardens had multiple fobs that were surrounding the foundry. Uh, we were getting intel from uh, 22 ACR and as well as death uh, from Swords of Marrow, uh, picking out targets as well as uh, random pings on the maps for fobs being found by other colonial soldiers. Once we took the town down, uh, we started focusing on the safe houses. Um, the safe houses were being taken out by infantry. And uh, I think it was about, yeah, 1317 on day 137 where we rolled in the CV and um, made the town colonial. Last question. Uh, since all this happened uh, three hours ago, would you say that the eclipse that happened on day 135 is the black day of the Warden Army? <laughs> yes, it definitely uh, It was something of uh, note. Uh, in the middle of our fights, a giant eclipse happened, and uh, we took that moment uh, and seized it, uh, meaning that uh, it was darkness for the wardens. Their their bell is was ringing, and uh, we were the ones with the mallet. It was excellent and uh, very odd. It happened twice. Twice? What happened about the second time? I believe the eclipse uh, restarted the calendar year from an ancient, uh, from at least lore, from what I can understand. 
um, it's kind of like a leap year thing. So I think after a leap year ended, I got back on track. It was kind of weird. So I am with the commander of the 222nd Legion Polski, uh, Commander Killshot. Yes, hello. First of all, uh, can you recount your operation, quote unquote, Polski D Day, glorious victory for the colonial army, death to all wardens? You see on the map those head. Over it, you have a, pl um, a sand where you can land. I got a fucking cargo ship full of everything. I got like ammunition for like two years there. You know, fucking 300 shirts. And then I got a barge with like 12 people of mine. My Polish, only Polish, you know, Polish D-Day. And then I landed on over Bucks Bay, the plaza. And then I landed there, fucking pushing with my troops, securing it, fucking building IFOB there and fucking securing it with pillboxes, gun nests and fucking AT guns. Then I pushed with a, squ uh, with a squad of eight w and with a fucking tank. I got a tank on a barge to, to the report, destroyed the town hall so we can fucking have a good point to drive through. We drove through, we fucking were on Fishhook Bay, you know the road, t the outstretch. We were at the... Um, at the little fort, you know, the port. And we cut off the logistics, cutting the full island where it was taken over from Ivans to the ID, shelter course and the report. Everything was taken over by the wardens. And we then we cut off the logistics so no fucking wardens had uh, supplies. Alright, that seems like a totally true and not made up story in any way, shape or form. So, second question. What would you like to say to all the colonials out there in the world? The 227 Legion, Polski is the best Polski clan. Yes, very good, very Polski clan, good. Better than all the fucking Americans. Alright, if that's all, uh, thank you for your time. Have a good day, and I'll leave you to your... Uh, what drug are you taking right now? Weed. Alright, I'll leave you to your marijuana then. Have a good day. Yesterday, the colonials had a big Christmas counter-offensive. But, that was yesterday. Today, I am with the rising star of the Calan's Armored Wolves, Senior Officer and Battle Tank Commander, Mr. Magic Mark. Actually, Mr. Magic Mark is my father. Ah, uh, my apologies. And this lovely lady is... Agatha. Agatha the Builder. Uh, actually, you put your mic up to her, but Agatha is, uh, is mute. Can't talk. Oh, oh, my apologies. My sincere apologies. I'm so sorry. Oh, it's okay. Her family was bombed by colonials. She was young, and but um, losing her voice actually heightened her building ability. Ah, alright. But speaking of Jade, uh, that is the place that we are in right now. The town is a bit of a strategic position, but... Until yesterday, the fortress on this western front was the town of Kingstone inside Westgate. I suppose the fighting started around a week ago. Uh, can you tell us about the first day? I uh, didn't know at the time that Agatha had already teched up the safe house. And uh, it's sort of a new invention that the wardens have made where it's artillery proof. I got there and I was I was running around and... Uh, and I fought on that hill for a few hours. Uh, I kind of I kind of realized at this moment that there's something special about Kingston. I just started thinking about this for a second. Well, I didn't have too long because they started howling us. Gunboats were surrounding us. Uh, it was probably over 500 shells. And at the same time, we're trying, we know, we're, we don't know if we should repair it. We don't know if we shouldn't repair it. But we realized it won't go below 30-something percent, 31 percent. Safe houses, uh, must have been four or five people in the safe house that are Abandoned. I said, no, don't. We can hold this safe house. We can hold this safe house. And, oh, um... Uh, what did the colonials uh, come with? Like, did they have uh, tanks already by this point? Did they have half-tracks? At the beginning, it was just half-tracks. But the siege of Kingston's safe house lasted five real days. Five real-life days fighting for this, trying to push back. You know, we would push up to Longstone, but then they would always come back to, you know, and push back. But they could never break Kingston safe house, you know. And, and as we pushed up, we would constantly lodge here during the days and things like that. I, I was doing 18, 20-hour shifts defending Kingston safe house. Agatha and I both lost sleep. Let me, 
let me digress a little. So, you know, probably 10, 12 hours in, I started to realize there's something special about it. And we realized, too, they had a howitzer. They must have used over a thousand shells. Now over a thousand flash. shells? Over a thousand shells. Um, you know, I think the third, by the third time we got pushed back, Agatha and I were out there and it was just me and her and all new people again. So it was almost the same morale battle where they were, oh, we're going to lose this safe house. This house is going down. And I was like, we're not going to lose the safe house. This safe house will not fall. It got, it got, uh, it got to the point where Agatha and I started to form a bond, like, because I would see her, uh, as sort of a familiar, familiar face, and, and, uh, I would be like, um, Agatha, I need, I need barbed wire here, I need barbed wire there, I'd take this out, we need to put stuff here, they're gonna, we're gonna lose this front any minute, we're gonna be surrounded by, come on, take, take all this out, put barbed wire here, just barbed wire everywhere, block us in if you have to, you know? So, uh, so the second day, um, it was lodged up and lodged up, and then they put back to Kingston Safe House, and the, and the fight started again. Um, and we got completely cut off. We got completely cut off. They pushed past us, and we had, I think, we had just gotten in a huge order of shirts before they cut off the lodgy. So we had, like, 300 shirts in the safe house. And in my head, I'm like, we can hold this. I think we were cut off for three, four hours in real life. And um, at one point, Sergeant Line... I uh, did a water landing uh, with an APC behind the Kingston safe house and walked the shirts up. Literally died as he was depositing the shirts just to keep us going until the front could catch up and push us back. And, um, and we would give them, especially at night, we'd run out with shotguns. and It was it was house-to-house fighting with shotguns. And that can be quite devastating if you're trying you know, to have a back line, have a uh, half a dozen you know soldiers backlining. Your uh, your push with shotguns at night is, is you know it's going to be really tough and I can mortar their Ford fives just four shells you know so I could walk out and mortar them so then they realized they had to deal with us like it couldn't take Westgate without taking Kingston Safe House yeah. and then they got tanks and they started to come up with the tanks and Agatha would hide AT turrets and bushes she got a lot of kills with those and you could shoot the RPGs from the window and it had great distance so they would come up they would come up and boom we would hit the tank with two rpgs at the same time and then one more and you know and, and we would finish three at the three at the same time oh, uh, we took lord. 17 takes 17 tanks that 17 tanks yeah dear lord well well we would get cut off for periods of time but we were so stocked uh and then the periods when they would push up to we would just lodge it because it was something like the safe house is never gonna fall. Like we're not gonna lose this safe house. Which uh, brings uh, up the question: uh, What happened yesterday? How did they take over the entire region uh, that quick? I I think they took advantage of all. Uh, from what I heard from the forces, they all logged in on uh, midnight East Coast time and uh, America Eastern Standard Time on Christmas Day, and and they did a massive push. So I think it's safe to say they don't believe in Santa. First of all, which is a shame, and uh, and second of all, that's I guess you know there was really probably no one there that, that could uh you know that that could rally the troops or that could that could set their spawns, so they pushed us out. But we're at Jade Cove right now, and this will never fall. This place is a fortress. It's just too much of a choke point. There's no way this is gonna fall. There's no way the Colonials can take this over. All right, that's good to hear. Uh, how about you, uh, Agatha? What do you think? Hold on, she's, uh, okay, I, just reading this, I'm not too great with sign language. Oh, I no, no problem. Me, uh, one second. Okay, so I'll sign Okay. Hmm? You know, it's a good thing I didn't uh, hold up the microphone to your mouth again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, uh, she thinks, uh, that's, uh, landing. She thinks Apollo's landing is easier to hold than Jade, than Jade Cove. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, once you build the two safe houses, it's very hard for to it's very hard for them to get past the two bridges. Uh, Apollo's Landing are the is the uh, area north of Jade Cove, correct? That's right. Yeah. She says. Meanwhile, Jade Cove can easily be be destroyed by a gunboat, and the southern safe house can be cut off. However, the two safe houses north of Jade Cove can easily hold the bridges. Interesting. Interesting. She says it's not... Hold on, hold on. What is that? What is that? What is that sign right there? Oh, okay. She says it's not Jade Cove itself, 
but those two safe houses have teched up. Ah, oh, yes, yes. Well, you know, but I well, hope uh, it never comes to this. I think Jade Cove will, as you said, will never fall. No, no way they're gonna take Jade Cove. Jade Cove will be here till the end of the war. I hope so. Strong and supplying us as ever. I mean, we've got the factory, the refineries teched up. A lot of people put a lot of time into, uh... Alright, so I suppose you'll be going now back to the front, back in, uh, the River Mercy and oh, the yeah. Rock Bridges. It was a good time talking with you. Uh, thank you for your time. Have a nice day. Thank you. Okay, this is interviewing Black Mamba on the first battle tank, World Conflict 19. <clears throat> so, uh, tell me, uh, who were the crew? Did you all create the tank yourself, or did someone else build it and you guys just took it off to the front? Um, it was it was both. Um, the person who built the tank was Zevis. I haven't seen him around for a while, but he was one of the main logistics operators of Colonial in that war. And um, he was crewing the tank as, I believe, Gunner. Mm -hmm. um, and the other crew members, um, the predominant ones for the time we drove that tank, there was, um, there was Fonzie, there was Hectic, um, and there's one other dude. I don't, I don't recall who it was. Um, how and where were, uh, did you first use it? Did you organize an operation with a clan, or are you in a clan, or did you just go by yourselves to the front and sort of felt your way around? No, well, word word got around that we um, that we had a battle tank coming out. And everyone was pretty excited because obviously it was the first first one in the game. So um, we sort of put the time out there. A bunch of people met us. There was the song guys driving support for us the whole time. And um, yeah, we started in Heartlands and drove straight up to Loftmire, I believe, where the main warden attack was coming. They had about one more victory point to take. And that was yeah, that was where we first first engaged and drove the battle tank. How did the battle tank perform? Did it meet your expectations? Well, that's um, that's a funny thing. We didn't really know what to expect. Um, we we considered this first this first run to be a test run. Uh, we didn't we didn't really want to field test it. We just um, oh sorry, we did want to field test it. We wanted to just get it straight out there and see what it was capable of. So the first time we we drove it up, um, it was it was spotted very early by the wardens, and. Um, we drove it up and started attacking, and they just they they came out of everywhere. They were running, they were running from everywhere with uh, sticky bombs and throwing smoke, and they were just cut down. They, uh, they probably lost about 100 infantry, I think, in the first 20 minutes or so. Uh, how did the how did it meet its end? Was it ever destroyed, or did it keep fighting till the end of the war? Yeah, well, um, the more the more kills we racked up, the more confident we became. So. Um, we ended up traveling over to Umbral Wildwood. There was another major warden attack. And we had great success there, took out a lot of light tanks. They didn't have any battle tanks out on the field yet until we overextended just due to um, overconfidence and were surrounded by, must have been over a dozen light tanks and taken out. That's quite an amazing uh, story. What sort of a undertaking was it just just to get all the shells and obviously the materials for it? Did how long did this take? Well, Zebus was the main the main man behind preparing the tank. Um, I did a bit of help as well. Um, I, I think I spent maybe three hours preparing the uh, high explosive shells because it was only the one factory that we had access to, and I had to actually drive behind enemy lines to bring them back to Heartlands. Um, so I guess all up, just fueling the tank. Um, preparing, like the pre-preparation probably took uh, all up maybe 10 man hours aside from aside from the harvesting of the tech parts. Well then, uh, thank you very much for joining us and hope you have a nice afternoon. Hey, you too. Thanks for having me. It was a new beast and it was causing mass retreats and lots of demoralization amongst the water drinks. And it was had its eyes set on hauling through Longstone Infantry, and I had been fighting desperately to keep it at bay. 
alongside its colonial tank squad that arrived on day 225. However, it was still rolling through, and many wardens were calling for its retreat. I became the gunner with a man by the name of Smy as the driver. Soon we linked up with two other tanks, crewed by Ollie, Skellington, Adabud, and Kigamusha. We became a sort of ragtag tank platoon, a last bastion of hope for Longstone. We soon became entangled in a huge mess of street fighting that kept the squad informed of enemy movements. Soon enough, at about noon, an enemy platoon of tanks appeared on radio. Four light tanks, the battle tank, and two half tracks appeared on radio, and, of course, I ordered a retreat. They caught up to us. In a furious exchange of fire, all three of our tanks were hit at least once, while we all backed up and fired wildly into the smoke to try and cover each other. We made it to the gate, closed it, and made some hasty repairs. It was here that we all came to a decision. We would make our stand here. I could no longer see the enemy platoon on radio as our radio towers had been taken out. Cautiously, we opened the gate. And lo and behold, rounding the corner are two light tanks and a battle tank, as well as an accompanying half-track. Panic shouts soon filled my ears and everyone screamed together. I pulled the trigger, loosing an AP round straight into the side of one of the light tanks. The other light tank is also hit by my fellow squad mates. For some reason, however, the Colonials decided to be extra aggressive and decided to punch us, hitting us more and more. We reversed, firing all the wire back out the gate. Smize keeps screaming for more fire, but I can barely understand them over his French accent. One of the enemy light tanks is disabled, then finished off. Its husk prevents the battle tank from an attack. The remaining enemy half-track is swiftly dispatched by Adabud and Kegabusha, and the BT retreats. Cheers are up from our infantry and ourselves, ourselves more shocked that we had survived at even one engagement. The gate closes and we repair all the skeleton tank to drive in condition, and we hastily retreat to Ghost Room Club to drink, repair, and refit. At the fob, three more tanks join our little ragtag squad, making us, in total, six tanks. Ready for a fight? I tell the squad to roll out. Soon we see it. Our allied infantry in the house had been slaughtered and the destroyed building was now occupied by colonials. The BT is sitting next to the house, firing at anything that moved. We ride around, trying to find a way to safely attack when we spot the two remaining light tanks. We quickly charge at them, overwhelming them and knocking them out without sustaining much damage. Emboldened by all of our successes, we charge as a unit. All tanks run in, screaming bloody murder, ready to do or die. Encircling the BT, shot after shot is fired into it. It fires back, nailing one of our tanks, and it instantly dies. Still, we press onward. We continue firing. One, two, three AP shells nail into the BT side from our tank, and it explodes. A resounding cheer can be heard from all the wardens on the field. We run down the two half-tracks, dispatching them with AP rounds straight through them. Regrouping at the TH, we head back to the Ghost Road Bob. One tank had been destroyed in the engagement with the BT, two of its three crew killed. Another tank had decided to stay back in town and repair there. The original squad, plus one more tank, small and Smy and I back to the fob, where we would drink and celebrate our victory. Aside from being one of the first to engage in battle with a battle tank, Officer Cadet Nick Six was also there when the first ever rocket built to the 19th conflict of the Foxhole War was launched into the town of Spade on day 340. Now, this might sound wrong, but I was curious about the destruction. I wanted to see firsthand just what had happened to the town. So I traveled to Spade under the white flag, hoping to see destruction without being shot. At first, I was unable to establish contact and was shot at at every instance, but upon hopping into a pillbox and discussing things with nearby colonials, it seemed safe to exit the structure. But the way I actually gained a trust and would actually st stop getting shot at was by healing one of their colonial's brethren who had been shot and was bleeding. His name was Terran? I don't know his exact name. Space Marine? Something like that. Upon learning that I had healed one of their comrades, we struck up a very uneasy truce. Upon seeing the destruction, I was struck silent. Nothing was left. The vehicles were on fire. Buildings were destroyed. It was chaos. It was pure chaos.
What is it, Guardsman? Are you shirking your duties? Where's your uniform? Uh, no, sir. This is a uniform from the press corps. We dare not do come up. We do broadcast for the people back at home. The press corps? Would you take pictures and talk to people? That sort of thing? Yeah. And uh, we let the people at home see what the troops in the front lines are doing. Well, sounds like a bad idea to me. Uh, wait a minute. How exactly do you serve Callahan? Uh, I don't know, sir. I just heard that you were part of the forces that face off against one of the first Lance battle tanks yesterday. Ah, uh, yes. Heretical machinery, or rather manned by heretics. The machine itself is to be admired, to be respected. Um, to respect one's enemy is not heresy, it's written in doctrine, but uh, facing off against that thing, uh, yes, it's... Uh, it took its toll, especially on the men that were uh, hunting it throughout uh, Upper Heartlands. It took us around uh, two days of patiently playing cat and mouse with the thing before it uh, finally revealed itself west of Greenfield Orchard. Uh, thankfully, I was attached to uh, a Dreadcore uh, tank group that was stationed there along with uh, several of the tank divisions from, from different uh, corps within the Warden Army. Um, thankfully, I was with uh, a rather experienced and uh, well-learned tank commander by the name of uh, Commander Maybar. He uh, directed uh, our small uh, vanguard of captured heretical vehicles towards the Colonial Battle Tank and observed through his binoculars, and I, I did find this quite astonishing and quite, uh, uh, I want to praise the commander in question uh, for his service to Callahan in this specific instance. Uh, he waited for the vehicle, he waited for the vehicle to, to load a shrapnel round aimed at uh, killing uh, our infantry, our brothers fighting the heretic toe-to-toe -to -toe with bayonet and, and rifle. Uh, Yet, uh, obviously, them throwing themselves at this, these machines is a sacrifice that I, myself, am more than willing to make. But Commander Maybar saw it a, a different way. He uh, asked uh, the, the local uh, other uh, tank division from the other corps to accompany us, and we charged the heretical vehicle at full pelt. Uh, not a, a word of hesitation was felt from the death corps drivers or the guards, uh, is, as is what to be expected, or they, they would have felt a, a sharp, uh, sharp round in the back of their skull quite easily, should they have even shown a hint of fear. Uh, yet we, we charged the vehicle, we, we subdued its support vehicles, uh, two uh, colonial light tanks, if I'm not mistaken, and encircled uh, the monstrosity that is the, uh, the lance, as you, as you said. And uh, in unison, and uh, with our penetrating shells newly developed from uh, our, our back lines, we pierced the monstrosity's hull, and uh, we must have met with something uh, combustible within, and it uh, exploded almost like uh, from within, uh, like we hit the ammunition or something like that. But uh, very quickly, our, our guardsmen that were left, that were, that were pushing against this monstrosity, rushed forward to, uh, to secure the ground that we had taken, and we fell back, and I praised everybody involved. It was, uh, it was something truly to behold. We did not suffer a single casualty during the assault, um, yet we, we, we delivered a, a devastating blow to uh, the Colonials, which I am very, very proud of. Um, but uh, nevertheless, you know, uh, purging heretics is, is something that we continue to do day by day. It's, it's my full-time occupation, uh, as is the occupation of every warden soldier. And uh, if I had a message for the people back home, I would say that uh, have faith in Callahan. Have faith in the fact that we are devoted to him and that we will not give up on Callahan and therefore Callahan will not give up on you. Oh my, what a message. So let me just get to say, this tank that is famed to be able to destroy one of your tanks with a one-two hit you suffered no casualties? No casualties at all? We suffered one glancing blow, 
uh, as I said, Commander Maybar was uh, very professional in the way that and calm in this situation. Uh, how he uh, approached the situation, he, he waited for the tank to load a shrapnel round, which is nothing more than a, a light canister filled with uh, ball bearings and, and things like that. Uh, things that are uh, decided to maim and uh, subdue infantry combatants, and that, that is what the tank was facing uh, at the time. Um, but with uh, with the astute knowledge uh, observed by Commander Maybar, the tank was able to be surrounded and uh, and then in unison uh, we fired with with uh, with the armor penetrating shells, as I said, and the, the thing just absolutely disintegrated before our mind. Oh dear! As is to be expected with any heretical uh, force, of course, eventually they will succumb and uh, sub be subdued by the will of Callahan, uh, as is with everything. Speaking of these uh, so-called heretics, sir, if, may, if you may excuse the question, there have been allegations of war crimes against uh, prisoners of war from you. Uh, what can you say about them? Are they true? Pr prisoners of war? I, I don't understand the term. Uh, elaborate. Uh, soldiers that have surrendered and are being kept being fed, being kept alive? You... You mean... Heretical? Uh, heretical... People? It, the Colonials? Uh, yes, I suppose. Well, uh, forgive me. <laughs> forgive me, there was a bit of a... Misunderstanding there. They, um... Do you... Do you actually class them as... As people? I mean, uh, Are they not... Mere animals? Mere heretics to be exterminated before the will of Callahan to you? Uh, they are citizens of the Vilian Republic, yes. Uh, some are from the Lafaria land of Mysia. They are nothing but heretics that wish to take your land, your people, and sully the good name of Kalahan. Do you disagree? I do not want to see what will happen to me if I do. Do you disagree? Uh... No, I suppose not. Good. Guardsman, remove this man from my vicinity and check his papers, please. Right now, I am with Major Lord Metal of the Assault Support Squadron. Hey, is this thing on? Uh, yes, I suppose it is. Aye, well, good. Right, how long is this going to take? Around maybe five minutes of your time, good sir. Oh, well that's good then, because we've got a war to fight. Alright, so, when the Warden's army pushed into the Umbral Wildwood region on day 222, it seems that the ASS clan was not uh, in there in the initial push. Uh, what did you guys achieve in there once you caught up to the region? Well, when I finally got to the bloody region, I went to the front line, which was at Dredgewood at the time. I ended up finding out that it was, well, as but as usual as you would expect a front line to be, absolutely shit, to say the least. Along with it, however, we managed to have a look inside, see what was there, and I was surprised to find that there was nothing to deal with tanks, and guess what they sent against us? I'm guessing tanks? Big fucking tanks, it right? On that one there. And with that, all the boys who were around, there was barely even a veteran amongst them. Maybe one or two, but they were sort of like, doing their own little thing. They were a mortar team, they were maybe one or two guys holding a HMG. Nothing really brilliant, it was mostly all these regular new boys that have came to the war. Ah oh, yes, when uh, conscription was enacted this war. Oh, you're telling me about it. I've had to be training them on all the fronts, from Reaching Trail, Fisherman's Row, and even on to uh, Tempest Island. I've been going to these fronts, trying to teach these boys how to hold the right end of a bloody rifle. Some can't even do it without pissing their bloody pants. Look like they want to cry. Go home. Well, they're not going to have a home if the Colonials keep it up. 
Alright, so back into the main point on Umbral. What did you guys do? Uh, the, you said the front had stagnated. No, the front had heavily stagnated due to a lack of supplies to deal with these sort of vehicles and tanks and such. So, essentially all that was happening was that our boys were just throwing their bodies at them. And essentially, that, that's not going to win the war. That's going to get us killed. That's going to get us destroyed. And that's not going to work for us at all. So, I informed my fellow ASS members and personnel of what was going on. And up the chain, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Maranova decided to gather a commando unit. The commando unit managed to take a lot of the western towns on the colonial front of Umbral Wildwood. And that included the likes of Golden Root Ranch, Border Watch and Sentry. And Sentry was the most defended of the towns, which isn't saying much because the town had a massive flaw in its will built walls and that was it the case that the one of the walls was essentially defenseless there's in nothing there to stop us no one shooting us no one watching out for us nothing so we broke in got to the enemy's town hall destroyed it and after a certain amount of time we managed to get some more forces in there in order to rebuild and recapture it for ourselves this included the lakes of wrecked and <clears throat> various other regulars. So, while he was away doing that, I was still at the front line, and a young Staff Sergeant approached me called Staff Sergeant Holy. He approached me and he said, Sir, uh, I have some men under my command, but I don't know what to do here. Can you show me where to take these boys? And I said, Hold on a minute there, lad. I've got an idea. I informed Lieutenant Colonel Maranova, and then he said, hmm, why don't you bring them this way? So I did. And that commando push turned into a front line road stop, in which case it stopped any enemy armoured pushies coming from the fobs below that area. South of Hermit's Rest, which ended up making the enemy's attempts to fight us much, much more painful. Alright, so Major... Major, where, where are you going? This, this bus stop is passing, you say? We're going out to fight a real war, you say? Uh, Alright, then. Uh. Well, that has been Major Lord Metal of the Assault Support Squadron. It was a good uh, five minutes talking with him, but it seems he has went off to war once again. Today I am with Crimson Skies, the Executive Officer Force, who are fighting non-stop since the Assault Support Squadron pushed all the way up to the crossroads south of the Hermit's West. So, uh, let's get a scoop. How was the region at the time the XOF outfit arrived at the region from the Heartlands? So, when we finally built our battle tank, the region was a mess. Um, our supply lines weren't secured. Uh, Hermit's Rest itself was a fortress, but the Wardens had three different fronts. We were actually drifting back and forth between literally three front lines. It was one at uh, the Dredgewood, one northwest of Hermit's Rest, and then one just south of Hermit's Rest. It seems that the ASS clan was able to push all the way up the frontier and up into like just south of Hermit's Rest itself. Yeah, um, ASS's assault was honestly impressive. Um, in a good way for them, I guess. If I was Warden, I would have been happy to be there. The amount of armor that we lost was incredible. Yet, uh, ASS pushed up from the frontier like that, that crossroads um, southeast of uh, the frontier. They ended up pushing up to the crossroads uh, just south of Hermit's Rest, knowing that that's the main place we were uh, ferrying supplies in from Dredge Fort. Um, so they ended up pushing up there. 22 ACR lost their tank uh, at Hermit's Rest. And... We were lucky enough to not be hit by the same things that they did, that they were hit by. Alright, so actually taking back uh, the entire region, how was that? How was the entire thing after almost a complete month of back and forth skirmish along, just around Hermit's Rest? How did it go from that to taking the entire Umbral region? It was like night and day for about a month. It was just, it never ended. 
we, we were honestly like, I mean, like I said earlier, it was impressive. We were honestly just amazed at how much, how little we could do. We could float around and defend as much as we could. We could try and, you know, smack them back here, but then, oh, they're being pushed in through here, you know, somewhere else. So we had to run over there. And then I remember when it happened, cause it was, it was, um, um, it was like seven light warden tanks all pushed at once and they all died and then after that it's like they just broke and there was nothing on radar and as soon as that happened we just started to push we we pushed down to the crossroads uh, uh south of the frontier um with i think som was there with us it was som um and then a lot of randoms were there but basically so we pushed out to the frontier we took sentry we took Border Watch while SOM went up north to Thunderfoot. Um, I forget who took Golden Root. It was probably a collaboration or just SOM. I don't know. But then we kind of met up at Thunderfoot. We pushed north. And that was when the final, like the last, I forget who took Stray out. I think that was also SOM. But that was when we, like the final big fight happened at the Foundry. When we took the Foundry, I mean, I hate to say it because, you know, I, I don't want to be uh, known as one of those PVE clans or whatever, but but the truth is the wardens were just gone. It, it went from a constant assault to just they were gone. They were, you could tell that they, they weren't prepared when we got to the foundry. I don't think they expected us to actually take back the entire region. So when we got there, the, the last few defenders they did have, they either had nothing or no morale. Quite interesting, as uh, when ASS initially pushed, the towns of Golden Root to Thunderfoot to Borderwatch were actually in the same sort of predicament. They didn't expect anyone to push all the way there, so they were pretty lightly defended. So it's fairly interesting how history kind of repeats itself, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, after the retaking of the entire Umbral region, what did you guys do? Did you guys go into Heartlands or Westgate? Uh, what did you do next? After we retook the region, SOM offered to stay behind and build, and I was thankful for that, actually. Um, we rearmed after we retook Umbral, and then we pushed uh, east, uh, north of Steely Fields. We went up there, and um, the Wardens were pushing from that mo northeasternmost town. I want to say it's... Greenfield Orchard? Greenfield Orchard, thank you. That was their like main town, and they were pushed far to the south. Uh, west, I think it was, uh, fighting a front line down there. So we just drove our tank in, and we cut through, um, I'd say, a moderately thick amount of defenses, and then we just destroyed the town hall. That switched over the warden uh, front line to a different base where they probably had less uh, equipment. But the main, but I just, I just want to put it out there that the main reason Harlan's was taken back was because of Prehinto's efforts and everybody else that was there. I think that we just kind of gave them that little bit of edge they needed to finally retake the region. Today I am with Captain Dick Smooth of the Colonial Army and interpreter of the Chinese Lion Clan, who are the builders of the first ever ballistic rocket ever made in the 19th conflict of the Hoxall Wars, the very same rocket that hit the town of Spade on day 340. But, before they could begin the construction rock itself, they had to retake the entire region of Westgate, which had seen constant fighting for more than seven months. Yes, hello there everyone. The retaking of Westgate took five hours. At the time, there was heavy fighting going on in Longstone, so twelve of us went up to the northeast border with the heartlands to cut their supply roads. We didn't have uh, the manpower to have a uh, lighting fast push. So we built up the Lenvo Lane Road all the way to the crossroad at, uh, at Gallows for three hours. Uh, there we were met with howitzer fire, we responded with our field artillery, and so we made it to look like we were sieging the town. In truth, we didn't actually want to take the town, uh, as we, if we did, wardens would just uh, spawn in Longstone or Kingston. Jeoparting our main objective, which was to battle up as many wardens until they ran out of shirts and supplies in the south. When they did, the rest of Western Colonial Army was able to retake the other towns, which is 
Once Kingston was taken, we fired up on the gallows somehow, destroying the last town the warden held in the region. In total, we destroyed four warden light tanks with our battle tank, and their defenses with our field artillery present. We have a gunboat patrolling the seas for any possible naval supplements, but no warden's boats were present. After we retake control of the Western Gate region, we immediately went to work on building defenses on the rocket site on uh, Iron 12. While we were building the propulsion device for the rocket, as it was being filled over the next 24 hours, the wardens uh, tried multiple times to destroy it. Uh, with landing on uh, Iron 11 and Fox 12. Uh, but we were able to defend it with the cooperation with SOM, 22 ACR, KOP, and many other comrades. Fellow Wardens, until recently, the war has been but a normal feud with a stubborn yet tenacious enemy. But the last few days proved more testing than ever before. Yesterday, the WNS and the Defense Force in Faranagh Coast came to make a difficult, heartbreaking decision. With supplies for our battle tanks dwindling due to the horrific bombing of Spade and the roaming barbaric colonial forces, our platoon was forced into a tactical retreat into better, the better defended northern positions. After holding for what seemed like days, it was clear to us that the missile site to the north would fall to colonial hands. And so the decision came to pass. We would bomb Jade Cove. This was by no means an easy thing to do. Jade Cove has been in the hearts and minds of every warden, a beautiful town to behold. But as with all beautiful things, they too must come to an end. So with a heavy heart, and with colonials threatening to conquer Faranagh completely, the WNS launched a ballistic rocket to deny the enemy such an important city, as well as take as many with it as possible, eradicating over two platoons worth of colonials. The memory of the town of Jade Cove will forever be in our hearts, fueling the fires of the revenge against the colonial threat. Praise be to Callahan. Today I am with 2nd Lieutenant Teep of the Global Army, who was stationed in the Faranak region just a week before the Jade Cove missile crisis occurred. So, may we get your side of the story? Oh, you know, uh, I'm just hanging out in Jade Cove, you know, recently promoted actually, uh, from Officer Cadet to 2nd Lieutenant, you know, kind of a big deal, but, uh, but basically, we're hanging out, Jade Cove, ain't looking good, three medium battle tanks, no anti-tank, nothing to deal with them except 120 house shells and this is all we got we got no logistics nothing nothing's coming to help us okay god's abandoned this land we're we're on we're the only people who's left and we're hanging out just southeast of uh of uh jade cove and we're at the twin mountains and the only advantage we have is that they're coming to us so we got to set up howies quick because we ain't we ain't got nothing in the area so we get two cvs start hammering away at those howies and they're making progress i'm telling you they they were real close at least uh, 80 meters, I'll, I'll give you, before we got the Howie's up. We got them loaded, we started firing, unloading. We, we knew, we generally were there, you know, general azimuth, and anywhere you'd fire, you hit one or two battle tanks at least. It, it was, it's, that's how tight the funnel is, and that's how much space those monstrosities take, so we were, we were good there. But um, 45 minutes go by, we go through those uh, Howie shells, like... Uh, like Fat Albert seeing a piece of cake, you know, it's 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 just fast, man. We had nothing else to, to keep us sustained, no logistics, and we lose them all. And then they push, destroy the Howies. We thought we were screwed until they just fall back. Nothing, they just left. I, I was I was surprised. I was shocked. It was a miracle. They just fucking left. So so we took this time to build everywhere, and we had actually destroyed the River Mercy, and then uh, later we'd walk because of uh, a few incursions by uh, medium battle tanks. And I was thinking, 
they got meat and battle tanks coming out of their pockets, and they haven't taken this place yet? We ain't got no friendly armor. We ain't got no RPGs, nothing. nothing absolutely nothing, okay? And they, they can destroy AT guns in a, in a second. So I'm thinking, what's going on here, okay? And and after I go with a couple of guys on a mission to stop the wing block incursion, which is pretty easy, you know, orders can't do much. But uh, we were up at Jade Cove. We go there, uh, and it just, it's a, it's a bridge. It's a bridge fight. Both bridges destroyed. Um, ain't looking too good. Uh, a warden driver drew, uh, drove a tank down into the canal and uh, we tried to take that. Didn't have much uh, success. But that that's when the historic event being the new king of Jade Cove was, was first alerted to everybody there. And we got that 10-minute warning. And uh, we, we scuttled the tank, blew it up. It was a medium battle tank, by the way. Uh, blew it up um, and just started discussing amongst ourselves what we're going to do. Is it real? Is it fake? Are they, is this a scam? I, I, we didn't know until, you know, the rest is history. So what happened to the men that did decide to remain in the Jade Cove area when uh, the bomb was dropped, the ballistic missile. Were they just gone? Did you reestablish contact with them? Or was it just silence? No one ever heard of them again. Uh, we, we went back in the town after the, the missile had landed and, um, uh, you know, we heard voices. You know, ghastly, ghostly husks of what people were before just lying on the ground, charred, destroyed, burning. It was crazy. Scary. I heard from other accounts that once the place was bombed, there seemed to be a tinge of red throughout the entire area. Is that true? Yeah, that's all I saw. I don't, I don't, I, I kind of, I kind of get a little broken up about it because you know all those guys who died were were helping me and I was helping them and we were we were saving the day, and uh, they they looks look like hell. What they went through, and they're all gone. It was just, it was literally hell. Hell on earth. I'm so sorry to hear that, man. But after after the missile crisis, what what happened to you? Did you continue fighting on the war? Did you uh, go home or given leave? Because I imagine something of that scale would be very unimaginable to a man. Even as a man as great as you, second lieutenant. Well, you know, uh, I couldn't handle it anymore. Uh, I, I had to leave when the relief forces came. Uh, you know, the relief forces came in numbers. We got we got thousands of guys storming Jade Cove friendlies, uh, trying to see what just what had just happened because everybody was in shock. Nobody knew what happened. So all the guys who survived the, the missile crisis uh, actually, uh, you know, were relieved of their posts for a short amount of time in the war, and uh, we all went home. Well, I am sorry to hear about the losses, both Warden and Colonial. I heard there were more bombings later on at Spade. Uh, I think that was before, actually. Spade, there was uh, Ogmaran and Sons Hollow. So very sorry for all the men and women who died oh, well, fighting. Well, there's forces. a difference there. There's a difference, okay? There, You can bomb Spade because Spade's a major, major ammo factory for the enemy. And, and they're killing our guys by, with that ammo. So I, I think that was justified. Ogmaron, same thing, was a, was a big base for uh, operations uh, for uh, Warden, uh, the Warden faction. So, you know, Jade Cove used to be a civilian area. Now it's, you know, gone. my perspective of the whole thing um i've from what i could tell j cove and as i have learned this war as well j cove is basically it's a sort of town where if you control it you do control the um, the entire region from what i can see of j cove it is a very difficult to flank kind of town you've um got a mountain to the you've got a mountain that's kind of just covers it's no I mean, it's like northern sector um, from enemies just going straight from Husk Hollow if they ever go across there. If enemies do try to bypass it, they get um, they get flanked by those coming out of Jade and trying to attack Jade directly. Well, it's um, the, all the work people put into it. It was built like a fortress, and not to mention that effort alone has is also has been a massive drain for the people fighting there. So, as a moral, as a tactical location, and one that is, you know, 
place where so many people put dedicated like countless hours into I do rec I do think that the new king of Jade Cove was a was a bad decision. If it, if it, is it one that that justified the you know like the the witch hunts and whatnot? No, because in my eyes, it's just a game. It's Jade Cove was going to come back next war. Let the result I've told them. Let the result of the war, you know, let that be the judge of whether or not it was a bad, um, good or bad decision. That's my um, that's my view on it. When we arrived at the last, the uh, situation was miserable. Warden infantry was scarce in numbers and the equipment was even scarcer. We didn't have enough men to hold all of the streets and we didn't have enough tanks either. The enemies exploited that by attacking with a light tank on each road, both defended and undefended, and overrunning us. While we were starting to retreat, one of our light tanks blew up immediately from a shell that hit it to the side, most likely from a battle tank. The rest of the tanks were able to escape and reorganized behind a huge fortress sitting on top of a hill. From then on, we continued bombarding the latch, the enemy forces in it, and the town hall once it was captured several times, blowing up logistic trucks, lone infantrymen which were unlucky to get shelled and most importantly the battle tanks this carried on for over a week after which the uh, lack of supplies as well as enemies uh, getting closer to the well forced us to retreat So initially when arriving to the uh, missile site in uh, weathered expanse, there were not many defenses at all. Most of the people had already pushed up to the Warden Port base and began uh, their armored column assaults on the uh, weathering hall. Uh, luckily, uh, Grom Hellscream uh, was there with some local conscripts at the time that I arrived at the missile silo, and his truck was uh, full of uh, materials such as BMATs and RMATs, ready to create defense for when the Warrens finally counterattacked. After the Warrens pushed through the uh, front line that the uh, people had set up at Weathering Halls, they proceeded to go down to the uh, missile silo. But uh, once they arrived, we already constructed ourselves a 150 meter perimeter of bunker walls and AT guns, as well as uh, many foxholes from leftover BMATs. After uh, many initial assaults, which consisted of maybe one or two warden light tanks and several infantry, they finally began to start stockpiling their armor for uh, big assaults. After the first day of fueling, we were able to uh, get the first regional fueling stage completed after the first day, and we're considering bombing weathering halls. But uh, once we knew that the war was nearing an end, and after making a risky decision, we decided to stay one more day to try to go for interregional fueling in Bomb Souls Gorge. Uh, the Warrens had at one point pushed all the way to the far west of our defenses, which was next to a mountain, and had brought uh, field artillery, which was within range and getting uh, coordinates. Uh, I was able to fire an RPG shell at the field artillery. Uh, that was the closest they ever reached the missile silo. Many other attempts, including three battle tanks at once, along with six light tanks, uh, was featured in the defense, but uh, luckily Lord Death, along with many other tank crews, arrived and uh, flanked them from the northwest through an opening in the gap while they were focusing down on the south. Once interregional uh, launching was complete, uh, we contacted the 22nd ACR as well as the 27th FRC for their assistance in uh, gathering the coordinates for the missile. They ventured out from Warren County and crossed over the border over to uh, Callahan's in order to obtain the coordinates from, for uh, Soul Scourge. After a second attempt, uh, they found a, a desirable high ground that were, they were able to uh, get coordinates. Within uh, the first seven minutes of gathering coordinates for the missile, they uh, began to receive howitzer fire, but since the Warrens had not known their precise location on the mountain, they were able to survive long enough to send the coordinates to me, uh, Labo Terra, and uh, War Crimes Morep. 
allowing us to uh, finally launch the missile into Solus. Uh, after the destruction of Solus, uh, one win condition was removed uh, for the overall war effort, allowing us to proceed forward with uh, capturing the skirmish regions. Ogmern and Solus Gorge have been bombed the past few weeks. Uh, whole squads of Ardens have just been packing up and going out. Oh, that, that seems to be on right now. Uh, you, sir, what night do your name be? Hey, I'm trying to spot... Oh, Frest. Okay. I'm uh, Comrade Green, the CCF First Commander's Directorate. Uh, CCF? We're a relatively new unit. We're kind of focused around taking ideas from the Colonials book. You could say we're an adaptable relief task force that can relocate quickly. Ironic. Uh, uh, Alright, so with the fighting that been, that's been going the past month now, surely the war will end in a couple of days, right? The situation here is dire at White Chap, but I think a morale is holding pretty well despite the circumstance. The Colonials have eight battle tanks, that we've spotted, but I feel like our RPG crews and AT crews still have a shot at taking them down one by one. We've been keeping them from advancing up the city with well-placed garrisons, and I'm pretty sure I heard word of a BT overextending and falling into our hands. Wait, 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 let me... Let me just reiterate that. Did you say eight battle tanks? Eight lance battle tanks? That was spotted, yeah. Some wooden models are sprinkled among them. The point is, Colonials might have more tanks than us, but they're shitty commanders. For example, back at Shattered Expanse a few weeks ago, my unit held off three battle tanks from advancing. We'd scraped together a quick crew from some of the CCF's best to man a BT that one of our crew happened to have a blueprint for. We held Rapid Expanse against a battle knocking it out in the process. We moved to Shattered and engaged the Colonial forces there. Three battle tanks hit us of all things. Their shitty commanders pushed into us into them in infantry, and after prodding and teasing each other, we overwhelmed them with our superior firepower. Uh, the BT was called Little Death that we used there. We lost her after engaging what we think was a Colonial tank ace at the end of Shattered Expanse. I've been commanding a tanks for a long ass time. My first battle tank was involved in the invasion of Varina. We called her Stalwart. And I scored my first battle tank kill commanding him. He went down fighting at spearhead with my crew after our BT ambushed us there. We might not have battle tanks anymore, but I still run around the front spotting. Oh dear, uh, you, you remarked about the morale divide in army. May, if you don't mind, may I ask you to elaborate on that? Morale, huh? Yeah, I think we've been pretty low on that since Jade went down. People don't want to fight for a cause of trades in their midst, not to mention how ungodly a nuclear wasteland is. I witnessed that shit firsthand at Spade while well on the way to Faranak while I was commanding old Stalwart. Personally, I tell every WNS soldier I see to keep out of my way and avoid nuking. But at the end of the day, we lost the war when Jade fell. Not because it damaged our logistics like shells or anything, but because it felt like, you know, whatever we did didn't matter. Well, that's enough talking for now. I have to check on the map. My binocular is keeping them informed. I hope this gets to the CVN people, and it's any left to receive it at the end of the day. This morning, I had another talk with the Sivish diplomatic envoy. And here is the paper which bears his name upon it as well as mine. Some of you, perhaps, have already heard what it contains. But I would just like to read it to you. Both the Valayan and the Sivish peoples have now put down their arms and our armies agreed to demobilize, leaving the region of the Faranic coast to the endless shore a demilitarized zone. We regard the agreement signed last night and the Siva Valley Agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples to never go to war with one another again. My good friends, for the 19th time in our history, a senator has returned from the north to bring peace with honor. I believe it is a peace for our time. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Go home and get a nice, quiet sleep. Citizens of Siva, do not be fooled by this colonial propaganda. The heathen scum may have pushed us back to the mountains, but I assure you, brothers and sisters of Callahan, with the start of this new year marks the end of colonial oppression. While they grow drunk on their so-called victory and celebrate, our death riders have been hard at work liberating internment camps, 
Our engineers are digging sapping lines, and our empire once again collects itself. They think us beaten. <laughs> we will educate them on underestimating our devotion as the true followers of Callahan. To anybody listening, death to the heretic. Long may Callahan's empire endure. I am Sakuya Ajiro. I'm here with uh, Serenity, and we're here to talk about some experiences that have happened since the bombing of Jade Cove and the discourse that started after that event. Uh, so first I want to start off, do you still have any hard feelings towards uh, Warden Northstar? Oh no, not at all. Um, I don't think I really had that much to begin with, other than just I didn't like how they dragged us into the situation forcefully, um, at least in my perspective of things. Have but you spoken I, with Emperor since the event? Yeah, plenty of times. Uh, we fought alongside, now that he switched back to Warden, uh, hopefully for good this time, and uh, we play Stellaris every few days, so yeah, we've been pretty good buddies ever since I came back. Alright, it's good to hear that. Uh, what about the other clans that had been berating WGA? Have you spoken with anybody from, uh, say, Warden Navy before? Uh, I was a temporary member of Warden Navy when I came back to Warden just to get myself back on my feet until I could figure out where I wanted to send my permanent home in the form of a clan. Uh, so you, so like you a... went back to them even after the things that they had said? It was a tough decision because one of the admirals, I don't want to say who, um, was throwing out slurs about my sexuality, which I'm not op completely open about, but that's what's Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, so, why would you uh, work with Warden Navy after that, when you came back to the Wardens? Why not go to, for, for instance, Warden Northstar? Um, I tried out for War North Star for a little bit, but I just wanted to see a clan that I knew could grow without having the affiliation of something that drastic. Not to say that they're a bad clan themselves. They are wonderful people. And most of the people from War Navy are too. It's just that one or two people from the higher ups is caused a lot of drama in my DMs and in my personal life. So you switch sides to the Collies, can you give us a recap on why? those who weren't here for the whole Ed Cove incident. Yeah. So, in my Discord DMs and a lot of my Steam messages, I kept getting a lot of backlash for being even somewhat affiliated with WNS. The reason I left Warden's mid-war and played Callies for another war uh, was because of the hateful DMs and uh, stuff like that that I was getting from mainly WN, but a lot of other places too, like randos who are really well known. I don't even remember half the names of them. But can you give us a little bit of insight as to your experience as a colleague compared to when you were as the Wardens? Well, it was really different actually. Um, surprisingly, a lot of them opened me and my newly founded clan uh, with pretty open arms, especially some. Uh, which I found really surprising because I disliked Sam a lot at the time. And yeah. uh, can you, uh, you said you started a clan. Can you tell us about your Collie clan? It was the same clan. It was just the few people that, that were close to me that wanted to switch over to Collie with me. And was that things. WGA or is it a different clan? Uh, it was from WGA to CGA. CGA. And what does that stand for? Uh, Colonial Guardian Aid. Ah, obviously. The experience on the college side was much more loose. You know, it didn't feel like there was much structure, as much structure as there was with um, the wardens and warden clans and co collect coalition of clans and stuff like that. All right. And so, what made you come back to the warden side after your experience as a collie? Um, it was also a tough decision because. The Collies just didn't care one way or another what side I fought on, whereas the Wardens tended to uh, dislike neutrals and uh, non-Wardens and stuff like that. Yeah, the reason I, I came do seem back, to say that a lot. Yeah. Um, 
the reason I came back, though, was because I still had a lot of people, more people than I knew on the Warden's side that still fought on Warden's than Colonial. And I was like, I want to play with more friends than I that I know well than just some new friends that I can play other games with on my own. All right. Um, just in general, trying to get stuff done without trying to force it upon you. You know what I mean? Of course. Uh, do you have any examples of any recent things that your clan has done uh, to help the warden front? Um, well, I can tell you about last war and this war. There, I have two big stories for that. Well, uh, uh, if you have big stories, you could, of course, uh, for this war, you could add it to the newswire. But just, like, uh, what, what your clan generally does to help the front on a day-to-day -day basis? Well... The current objectives for this war are pretty basic. Just try and fight the enemy in any way you can, whether it be partisans or doing logistics for randos or whatever. Uh, we've been busting tanks and uh, doing minor watching here and there for everyone. And just generally trying to help the people that have come in from the sale recently to learn the game. All right. Good to hear. Uh, are there any final remarks that you'd like to make before we head out here? Um, unless you have any questions for me, I don't think so. Uh, I just want to let people know that I have had a wonderful time playing this game, and it's just been awesome. Whether um, whether it be that I was fighting for one side or another, or just chilling out by myself, I felt like this game was amazing. All right. After Jade Cove, there seemed to be a deep well where the morale of the Wardens once resided. The Colonials simply pushed after that. No real tactical battle plans were drawn. Our commanders pointed in a direction and said go. Tactics were made on the fly. A lot of bodies got stacked at the crossfire between both lines. Eventually, it was the Wardens that got the short end of the stick. Having lost all hope to win the war after the betrayal of their own men, or rather, the lack of understanding of the tactical situation they had found themselves in at Veranic Coast, and the result of such, they began a withdrawal from less defensible positions, and reinforced larger ones, exposing their flanks every time, all the way to their home regions, where they finally decided to dig in. But it was too late. They were spent. All the time they had spent planning, gathering material and not fortifying their backlines had cost them everything, and morale in the last few days of the war was all but expended. The Colonials were vindicated, at last, over 300 days of holding on by tooth and nail paid off, and in a surprising twist of fate that was Jake Cove, this small gasp of shock and awe at the might of the V-2 rockets. The Legion took the opportunity, and it seized almost all Warden territory. At the end, the Wardens called for a ceasefire, and the Legion, satisfied with giving their foe their just deserts, agreed, and again, peace came to the region. But the cost of war did not simply take its toll in bodies. It took its toll in procedural regimentation. The lessons learned from the events at Jade Cove established a new method in launching rockets, a lesson that came at the expense of warden morale and trust between its members. <laughs>